Welcome. Tonight we're talking about another great Jewish personality. Of course, that's the Rambam, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, known in English as Maimonides, called by his contemporaries Hanesher Hagadol, with a great eagle. And he's one of the most legendary figures in all of Jewish history, certainly, but even in non-Jewish history, in just history, uh, one of the great figures of all time. He was a, a great figure, not only amongst the Jews, amongst the non-Jews, he's treated as a Renaissance man, someone who was exceptional in so many diverse areas of excellence, in philosophy, of course, as one of the great codifiers of halacha, of law, someone who wrote broadly on a vast array of topics, on mathematics, on astronomy, who wrote a series of books on, or treatises on medicine. But for us, certainly, he plays a very prominent role in Torah and in halacha. And his literary accomplishments, his literary accomplishments and his books are actually astounding. And it's mind-boggling that someone who lived a relatively short and very chaotic life was able to accomplish such, such titanic achievements. And even until this day, the Rambam, even until this day, the Rambam is very relevant because you walk into any yeshiva and you walk into any place where people study Torah and any Jewish bookshelf will certainly have uh, either a book of the Rambam, or books on the Rambam, or both. And in yeshiva, certainly, it's still studied uh, very, very intensely until today. In fact, there are many, many books that were written on the Rambam's books, and we have, on average, several hundred of those such books published annually. Uh, we're going to try to get a look at his life and his accomplishments, try to get a flavor of what he represented, and just to be clear from the get-go, it's very difficult to capture such a, such a, such a person, such a personality uh, with such accomplishments in so many diverse areas and, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a short period of time. So we're going to do our best to try to give a, a little overview and a sketch of his life and his accomplishments. The Rambam was born in Spain, in Cordova, in the year 1135. He was a scion of a great family of rabbis that traced their heritage all the way back to King David. And he comes, arrives into the scene at the end of what's known as the Golden Age of Spain, when the Jews living under Mus on the Muslim rule in Spain, but Muslim rule that was very tolerant and even very accepting of the Jews. And the Jews, uh, sort of like the way we are today in America, they achieved prominence in every area of life, even though the Muslims uh, were in control. Uh, that's going to change very fast, as we'll see, uh, because when the Rambam was but a teenager, a violent group of what we would call today Muslim extremists, they swept across Spain and North Africa, and that prompted the Rambam, al along with thousands of other Spanish Jews, to either escape or to convert or to be slaughtered. Now, his, he was primarily a student of his father, or maybe initially a student of his father, and he was also, he considered himself a student of the Re Megash, of Rabbi Yosef Ibn Megash. If you remember, we spoke about the Rif, Rabbi Yitzchak Al-Fasi, uh, who was the first one to try to codify Halacha, first one of the era of Rishonim to do so. His primary student is Rabbi Yosef Ibn Megash, and the Rambam considered himself a student of the Re Megash, even though the Rimigash died when the Rambam was but a young toddler. It seems likely that the Rambam considered his father, who was a direct student and disciple of the Rimigash, to be his teacher, and thus his teacher, uh, his father, learned everything from his teacher, who taught it uh, in turn to the Rambam. Thus he is, with his father as a proxy, a student of the Rimigash. And the Rambam, from the very earliest age, displayed fantastic ability. And one thing that everyone could agree about the Rambam, his critics and his admirers can certainly agree the Rambam was one of the most gifted men who has ever graced this planet. 
he seems likely he had a uh, photographic memory, uh, certainly a very superior analytical mind, and the ability to sit and study for hours upon hours on end. And now we don't want know much about the Rambam's early childhood, but we do know at the age of 15, the Almohads, a group of Islamic fundamentalists, they stage revolutions in Spain. And the nature of Islamic history is that you know, there's various different strands of the religion, and they differ primarily uh, with the degree of literalness that they accept the Quran and how serious a role it should play in modern day life. So while earlier they were living under Muslims that were much more moderate, now there's a sweeping movement of Muslims that are very fundamentalist, and they give the Jews essentially three options. You could stay and convert to Islam, you could stay and be slaughtered, or you could flee and leave all your possessions here. Now, this is, of course, a departure from the dhimmi status that the Jews had prior, where they were given a protected, quote-unquote, status. They weren't killed, they weren't compelled to convert, but they had to live as second-class citizens. The Almohads, they develop a religious rationale for changing this uh, tolerance for the Jews, and they uncover a teaching uh, alleged to be from Muhammad that we're going to tolerate the Jews for 500 years. If within 500 years their Messiah doesn't come, then we no longer treat them with the dhimmi status, and we treat them like we treat everyone else, which is nation of Islam, nation of sword, pick your poison. And they gave the Jews the option. Many Jews decided to uh, flee. The majority of them decided to flee. Some stayed and converted. Some stayed and unfortunately were killed. And the Rambam, very early on, is going to be confronted with the reality of Jews who nominally converted to Islam but really are secretly behaving as Jews. That, of course, is going to, to reach uh, you know, great heights or that reality, that problem, that tension, the conflict uh, during the Inquisition. When the Christians are going to do the same, they're going to force the Jews to convert. Many Jews are going to be closet Jews, underground Jews. Uh, the Christians are going to be very ruthless in their uh, persecution of Jews that they suspect to be Muranos, to be secret closet Jews. And this at, you know, in this point in time, it's going to be the Muslims uh, treating the Jews, or, or the reality that the Jews are going to be, some Jews are going to convert to Islam, but secretly still practice as Jews, and the Ramams have to deal with them. He's have to write about it and engage with it, because it's going to be a, a huge problem. The Ramam and his family, they pick up and they leave their homeland that they spent a long time in Spain, and they move to North Africa, to Morocco. Now, the problem is that the Almohads actually came to Morocco as well. So they had to flee and escape. They ended up living for certain parts of the ensuing years in caves, hiding from the Muslims. But the truth is, is that the Almohads in Fez, in Morocco, were much more, well, were, were, weren't as ruthless in their pursuit of conversion or killing and thus they had this existence where they were sort of, okay, relative peace uh, to, to live as Jews. During this time, the Rambam, he wrote a famous letter or a treatise called the Igeris Hashmad, which is the letter in response to heresy, alternatively called the Maimar Kiddush Hashem, the treatise on martyrdom. And this is a response to an unnamed scholar who wrote very ferociously against the Jews who capitulated and converted to Islam. And the Rambam, he writes with equal ferocity uh, in return, and he says that the people that converted to Islam, but they did it only on the surface, only in the veneer, only as a facade to be safe from the Muslim cruelty and brutality, they 
are still considered Jews first and foremost, but also they do not need to give up their lives to do that. We know that there are three cardinal sins. You've got to give up your life to not transgress. One of them is idolatry. But he rules that Islam is not idolatry, and therefore you do not need to give up your life uh, to preclude yourself, to yourself from converting. But he does write in this letter, uh, which caused a lot of problems with many of the Jews who had converted to Islam but were still part of the Jewish community in this weird way, where he writes to, to, to the people that it's still preferable for someone to flee and go into exile than to convert to Islam. And it seems likely that the reason why the Ramanis family had to leave Morocco and move initially to Israel and then to Egypt was because of the tension that his position uh, created between him and many of the Jews in, uh, in Morocco. At the end of the letter, I want to read the last few lines of the letter. He writes that we should not push away those that are desecrating Shabbos, and we shouldn't be disgusted by them. Rather, we should bring them close, and we should encourage them to do mitzvot. And that's always a tension where you have the idealists who say, we have to stick to Torah, and we cannot compromise in a slight little bit. And then you have the more pragmatist people who say, well, you have to t keep in mind the conditions and the circumstances that people end up in wherever they end up by and try to bring them as close as possible. Now, during the time where the Rambam and his family are hiding and are escaping and living in Morocco, the Rambam begins the first to write the first of his three monumental literary accomplishments. The Rambam wrote voluminously, uh, but there's three works that tower above the rest of them, and any one of those works on its own would be enough to guarantee the Rambam a place on the Jewish Mount Rushmore. Uh, but all three of them together, it's really astonishing. Uh, the first one he starts writing as a teenager is a Pirish HaMishnah, commentary on Mishnah. The Mishnah is almost a thousand years old at the time, and there has not yet been a complete commentary on all of Mishnah, and the Rambam as a teenager hiding out in caves starts to do that, and starts and completes, and completes that, uh, commentary in all 63 books of Mishnah. And he did a lot of innovations, the Rambam was a very innovative person, he wrote first of all in Arabic. And the reason why is because that's the language of the people. And the best way to be influential is not to write a book for the scholars, but to write a book for the masses of people. He wrote in Arabic, but the script that he used was actually Hebrew. This is the realm of innovation, to write with Hebrew letters, but the Arabic language. Uh, and we see this again throughout history, where great accomplishments ones that really make a huge influence on masses of people are ones that are written for the layman. And in the late 19th, early 20th century, the Chafetz Chaim writes the Mishnah Berua. Mishnah Berua is a book on one section of the Shulchan Aruch, which is meant for laymen. So who did he hire to edit for him? Who were the proofreaders? He got the people who weren't the scholars. They said, you guys, I want to hire a whole bunch of you guys in order to have people like you that aren't great scholars, if you understand it, I know I did a good job. He wrote it in Arabic, but there was a family, the Ibn Tibbin family, that were expert translators, and they would translate all the Rambam's works from Arabic to Hebrew, and there's been many subsequent translations as well. Now, additionally, the Rambam it always weaves into his commentary in the Mishnah what the Talmud says in that given Mishnah and what the Halacha is. So last week we talked about Rashi. Rashi is a commentator. Which Rashi is walking you in whatever we are discussing. We're learning Torah, how to read the Torah in the text. We we'll study Talmud, let's go. May hold your hand and guide you through the page. The Rambam, he gives you much more of a broader picture, and he'll actually pull out a little bit and give you a perspective of halacha. What are the conclusions of the debate? And that, of course, is going to be his lifelong mission to try to codify and formalize and make the halacha, uh, to, make it, uh, to, to, to reach conclusions and to reproduce that. Uh, that was something that's buried in the Talmud, and it's the work of a scholar to extract it. The Rambam extracted it and organized it on its own. Additionally, the Rambam also 
wrote in his commentary on the Mishnah, again, as a teenager, several introductions in various points along this book. And these form many of the basic tenets of Jewish faith. So, for example, in the introduction of the Mishnah itself, he gives a wide-ranging history of oral Torah, and he gets deep into discussion uh, the, the many aspects of the oral Torah and how it was developed and how it, uh, and, and, and the arguments, where the arguments come from, and he organizes the Mishnah and the order of all sorts of three books. Why is it written in this order? He goes one after another. Why the order is all logical? It's a very long, uh, it's, it's, it's not just a small introduction, it's a book on its own, uh, but that is an introduction to all of oral Torah, essentially. Uh, then, one of the 63 books of the Mishnah is the chapters of the Fathers, Perk Avos. That's the book on ethics and philosophy and character. And he writes uh, another introduction known as the Shemona Prakram, the eight chapters. It's eight chapters as where he's, ana- he's a- analyzing and uh, clarifying the various aspects of man's soul and man's psychology <laughs> and elaborating on what man's mission is in this world. Very fascinating and uh, esoteric work. Uh, the last great introduction that he has is an introduction to the chapter that deals with eschatology, and that's the second to last chapter of the book of Sanhedrin, which is called the chapter Chelek. And it starts off, the Mishnah starts off there, in fact in our version of the Mishnah, it's the last chapter, the Ramah is the second to last chapter, the Mishnah there starts off with Kol Yisrael Yeshlam Chelet Lomaba. All of Israel has a portion in the world to come, with the exception, he gives a list of people that lose their portion of the world to come. And the Talmud goes through 23 pages, all agadic, all philosophic, to discuss all the issues of heaven and hell and reward and punishment and Messiah and the afterlife, this world, next world. And the Rambam in his introduction to that chapter, he gives a treatise, a very fascinating treatise on uh, various issues that he discusses. He says, well, what's the purpose of, of mitzvot? We're doing mitzvot, so we get a reward. What's the reward? And he brings down five different opinions. There's five opinions what the reward is. And he doesn't like any one of them. And he introduces what the real thing, what the real answer is. He says, there's so much chaos and so much confusion. No one knows what they're talking about. I'll clarify it all for you. But first, you have to know. And he gives an amazing parable of what, of what, Life is, you know, is, is, are we just trying to get reward? And he gives the, the famous analogy of a kid, you want to get hit the study, you give him a candy. And he gets a little older, you have to take the candy and upgrade it to an iPhone. Right? And, he, well, is that what it's all about? We're just chasing reward? Or what about doing mitzvahs lishma, altruism? And then he talks about the three kinds of scholars and how they approach agadic portions of Talmud. You have the people who take it literally, says those are fools. You have people that take it never literally, those are people who are also fools. And then finally, he says, finally, after like 5,000 words, he says, well, let's talk about what I wanted to talk about. And he organizes what's Gan Eden, what's paradise, what's heaven and hell, what's the resurrection of the dead, what's Messiah. And finally, he deals with Olam Haba. It's a very fascinating read. And the end of that introduction, uh, and perhaps something that spurred the most controversy uh, of, the, of this particular book is where the Rambam organizes and presents his 13 principles of faith. He says these are bedrock principles that are necessary for any Jew to believe in. You reject one of them, you are rejecting a core element of Jewish philosophy, that's heresy, and you're disincluding yourself from the Jewish people, you're, ex- you, you, you are dis- you're disenfranchised the Jewish people, because these core beliefs are necessary for the entirety of the nation. Of course, that spawned much controversy. Well, how could you say that one mitzvah is more important than the other mitzvah? You know, if it's all mitzvahs from God, who are we to say that one's more important than the other? And it even spawned a whole book written by one of his contemporaries called Sefer Ikram, The Book of Principles, where the author, Rabbi Yosef Albo, he disagrees with the Ram. He says, no, there's not 13 principles. There's only three principles. You've got to believe in God, you've got to believe in Torah, and you've got to believe in reward and punishment. But the truth is, 
it's been pointed out that if you actually break down the Ram's 13 principles, you'll find that these 13 principles are actually those three principles of the Sefer Ikrim just fleshed out. To believe in God. Well, what does it mean to believe in God? So look at the first five of <coughs> look at the first five of the 13 principles of the Rambam. Well, the first one is gotta believe in the existence of God. And then you have to believe in the indivisibility of God. God doesn't have any parts. God's lack of physicality. God has no body. God exists forever. Nothing can exist without God, and God is not dependent upon anything else, but everything is dependent upon Him. And lastly, the last five of the first module is that only God is worthy of our worship. And then the next four, the idea of prophecy. If you don't have prophecy, you don't have Torah. Prophecy of Moses. Moses' prophecy is different than all the other prophecies of all the other prophets. Moshe is the father of all the prophets, and his prophecy is on a different level than everyone else's. The divinity of Torah, the Torah that we have today is not going to be replaced. We cannot add nor subtract from it. Again, those four are the second of Rabbi Yosef Albo's three principles. And lastly, reward and punishment, number 10 of the Rambam, God is aware of human actions. God will give reward and punishment uh, reward for good deeds and punishment for evil deeds, the idea of Messiah, reward and punishment, and of course, the resurrection of the dead. That spawned a lot of controversy, but regardless, history has vindicated the Rambam, and indeed, in every Jewish prayer book, we have the 13 principles canonized in both the Animamin, that you'll find after Shachris, and the Yigdal prayer before Shachris, which is a reformalization in a poetic way of the 13 principles of the Rambam. Now it's important to note, although the Rambam's 13 principles were controversial, no one actually questioned the legitimacy of any one of these principles. Everyone agreed that what he said was correct. They were only arguing whether assigning the term and the moniker of a principle was appropriate for these or for any uh, in, in reality, uh, or maybe they're all principles, maybe this is 113 principles, but either way, uh, this really shows, you know, the Ramam as a teenager is already has the gumption to tell the whole world one of the 13 principles of faith. Now, the Rambam, when he was 24, he moved, initially he moved to Israel, he didn't last there very long, and eventually he moves he moves to Egypt, and he settles there, and he actually lives there for the duration of his life. Uh, his whole life, he was dogged by the problem with living in Egypt. We know there's actually a myth in the Torah to not go back to Egypt. As an example, uh, one of the mitzvahs of a Kohen, I'm sorry, one of the mitzvahs of a king is that they cannot have too many horses. Why not? Because horses were native to Egypt, and thus... If someone's obsessed with horses, he makes it like, you know, that's his hobby to collect horses. It's likely that there's going to be an affinity towards Egypt, and he may try to bring the Jews back to Egypt, uh, and the Ram living, and then that's prohibited. And the Ram is living in Egypt, and in fact, we a actually found letters that the Rambam wrote, and he signed it, that I'm the Rambam, Moshe ben Maimon HaSephardi, the Moshe son of, the, of Maimon the, from Sephard, from Spain, HaOver Bechol Yom Bishlo Shalom, who every day is transgressing three prohibitions, the three prohibitions against living in Egypt. Very quickly, the Rambam becomes a leader of the Jewish community, he teaches Torah, and he completes his commentary on the Mishnah, and then a disaster and a tragedy that upended the Rambam's life really has, you know, the Rambam has to recalibrate. Now, his father, it's not clear when his father died. Did he die when they were in Israel? Did he die when they arrived to Egypt? But um, he died around, at around this time. The Rambam's wife died as well. He had to remarry. But his brother, his brother David, they had an agreement, him and his brother. Uh, the classic Yisachar Zavulan agreement. Two of the sons of Jacob, one of them was a Torah scholar, one of them was the business mogul, and they made a deal. You'll study Torah, I'll do the business, and we'll split the material profits and the spiritual profits. And 
The Rambam had the same deal with his brother. His brother was a mogul. He was a gem dealer. Then he would travel to very distant lands and trade the gems and become, he was very rich. And the Rambam was the great scholar and they made a deal, we'll split, but we'll split the best of both worlds. Unfortunately, the Rambam's brother, David, he was traveling to uh, the Far East and he was in a ship and he had with him the whole family fortune, to, gems to sell in the Far East, but also he had gems on consignment for others to sell for them. And unfortunately, the ship sunk, and it took with it him, he died, and all the fortune, leaving the Rambam without a supporter, but also with his brother's family, his wife and his children, that, that now they don't have a breadwinner, and also all the debts owed to his brother, all of that fell on the Rambam's shoulders, and he had to make a career pivot. And he had to find a way to support not only his family now, but also the family of his brother. Now the Rambam, it's evident in several places in his writing that he was conscientiously opposed to have people pay uh, for Torah study. So you look at the Rambam in the laws of Torah study, he writes very, with very sharp words not to accept money for Torah study. Additionally, in the Mishnah, in chapters of the Fathers, where the Mishnah warns us not to take the Torah and make it a crown to be glorified or a shovel to dig with, don't use the Torah to self-promote. The Rambam goes on a diatribe against the people who say, I'm going to study Torah, let someone else pay for it. Let someone else pay me to study Torah. So the Rambam, that was not an option. And the Rambam had to become a physician. He was a self-taught physician, but very quickly gains a fantastic reputation. He begins to practice medicine. Indeed, today we have books of the Rambam on dermatology. Uh, the Rambam was an expert in anatomy. The Rambam wrote books on pharmacology. Pretty remarkable, and his reputation grows, and before you know it, it catches the eye of the Sultan Saladin in Egypt, and he becomes the official house physician of the king and all the ministers and the robust, robust harem of women and children that the Rambam had to take care of. And indeed, the king was very fond of the Rambam. He appointed him as the official political representative of the Jewish people, the Nagid. Uh, in, in that capacity, the Rambam was very influential in garnering uh, concessions for the Jewish people. And the Rambam, of course, as in every area of his life, was extremely gifted and skilled in matters of policy and diplomacy. And that position will be given on to his son after he passed. There's an amazing letter that we have uh, from the, where the Rambam is writing to his translator. And the Rambam had a translator, Shmuel Ibn Tibbin, who would translate his works. So he lived in Provence. So he writes a letter to the Rambam one day. I want to come visit you. I mean, we've been in correspondence for so long. I want to come visit you. I want to come talk to you and just just to be there with you. So the Rambam tells you, listen, tells him, listen, in response, we have a letter here. Uh, it doesn't make sense for you to come visit me. Because even if you come visit me, we won't, even have, we, only have a, won't, we won't even have two minutes to talk. And he gives a little bit of an insight into the hectic and demanding lifestyle, just the day-to-day. -day. Like what did he do on a given day? And it's just mind-boggling, again, like with everything in the Rambam. And I'm going to read to you what he says over here. I live in Old Cairo, in Fustat, and the king is in Egypt, and it's in Cairo, and there's about a mile and a half distance between me and him. And every single day, early in the morning, I have to go and check up on the king and all the ministers. And if he's sick, or any one of the ministers is sick, I cannot possibly get home till very, very late. Once I finish checking up on them, I have to go, I have to go and check up on all the women and the whole harem, and the Ramam, he used to never eat when he was in the official palace of the Sultan, 
So the whole day he's working and he's starving. And about on a good day, he gets back to his house in the mid-afternoon. And he's absolutely famished. And he goes to his house and he finds his lobby is absolutely swamped with Jews, with non-Jews, with important people, with non-important people, with kings, with uh, judges, with just riffraff. Everyone's there and everyone has all their ailments. And I get off my animal, I wash my hands, I walk out to them and tell them, just calm down, I just need a few minutes to have a little snack. I have my little snack and right away I have to go and start offering diagnoses and writing prescriptions and by the time the last person leaves it's already nighttime and sometimes it's even into the night and I'm so tired and so famished that I have to actually lay down because I'm just absolutely exhausted and and it's by the time I'm done I can't even talk I'm so exhausted so that I'm in rights and he says the bottom line is that I can't talk to another Jew and talk Torah besides for Shabbos. Only on Shabbos. What happens on Shabbos? Everyone, the whole community converges and after the prayer, I lecture, I give a lecture and I give instructions for the entire community what to do the entire week. And we study until the afternoon and then they go home. And then some of them come back until the evening prayer and they hear a second lecture from me. He's, and he finishes, this is my daily schedule, but you should know, I only told you a little fraction of what really happens. Just the chaos. And so he says, don't waste your time making the whole trip to me because I'm not going to have time to talk to you. And it's pretty astonishing that the Rambam, despite having such a robust schedule, was able to find any time to study Torah, much less to write books and works that literally change the world. Um, during his middle years, he wrote his magnum opus, and perhaps the most significant book since the Talmud. And, well, I would say arguably, uh, or maybe even easily the most significant and influential book since the Talmud, that is the Mishnah Torah. Mishnah Torah, it's alternative called the Yad HaZakra, the Mighty Hand, and it's a collection of 14 books uh, that are, well, just the title, Mishnah Torah, which means a complete restatement of Torah. I'll have all of Torah, I'll, I'll write everything that you need to know in these in these 14 books. This is the only book that he wrote that was written in Hebrew. And the premise of the book is that we know Moshe gave the Jewish people the written Torah, but he also gave them the oral Torah. And the written Torah, that's a framework. That's a skeletal framework for everything you need to know as a Jew and how to live as a Jew. Uh, but the actual details, well, that's all captured in the Mishnah which is the laws, and in the Talmud. And the Ramam in his introduction he, uh, to the Mishnah Torah, he gives a history of the Oral Torah, and then at the end he captures it and says, well, this is my objective with the present book. I want to read this history, because it's really astonishing to think about the task that he set out for himself in writing this book. And he starts off, well, first he traces back uh, from the authors of the Talmud all the way back to Moses, the 40 generations from Rav Ashi wrote the Talmud to Moses, and he gives a whole history, um, and he starts, or he continues here with Rabbi Judah the Prince. From the time of Moshe until Rabbi Judah the Prince, no one had written any book of the Oral Torah. We spoke about this, we spoke about Rabbi the Prince. His, his role was to be the person to, to commit to paper a formalized, canonized version of the Oral Torah. And while the Oral Torah was written by individuals, just people kept notes, of course, but no one did a finalized, canonized version of it until 
Rabbi Judah the Prince. And why did he do it? Because of the conditions of his world. There was the Romans, they were causing tremendous persecution, and people were not stable, people, the Sanhedrin was under assault, and therefore he had to do it. And then we have 63 books of Mishnah that contain just the laws of the Oral Torah, and continues the Rambam, the subject matter of the Talmud, is the interpretation of the text of the Mishnah, and the explanation of its depths, and the matters that developed in the various courts from the times of Rabbi the Prince, until the writing of the Talmud. And, okay, well, what do you do with this tremendous body of work from the two Talmuds, and from the Tosefta, and from the Sifra, and Sifri, and from all the other associated contemporary works, you find Halacha. Halacha is what is forbidden, what's permitted, what's clean, what's unclean, who's liable, who's exempt, what's fit for use, what's unfit for use, and tracing back Today, how do we live today in the way that Moshe got from the Almighty at Sinai? How do we fulfill our obligation as Jews to live with the standards of halacha? And that's all captured in the Talmud. But in our time, continues the Rabbim, severe troubles come one after another, and all are in distress. The wisdom of our sages has disappeared, and the understanding of our discerning men is hidden. Thus, the commentaries, the responses, the questions, and the set of laws that the Gaonim wrote, which had once seemed clear, have in our times become hard to understand, so that only a few properly understand them. And one hardly needs to mention the Talmud itself, the Babylonian Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud, the Sifra, Sifri, Toseftos, which all, required a broad, uh, which all require a broad mind, a wise soul, and significant time before one can correctly know from them what is forbidden or permitted and all the other rules of the Torah. But the Ramam is saying it like this. To get halacha, you have to have a lot of time, and you have to be very gifted, and you have to be able to absorb all of this information. And the problem is people aren't doing it. It's only existing amongst the very select few. For this reason, finishes the Rambam, I, Moshe, the son of Rabbi Maimon, the Sephardi, found that the current situation is unbearable. And so, relying on the help of Hashem, I studied intently these works, and I sought to write what can be determined from all of these works in regard to what is forbidden and permitted, clean and unclean, and, all, and all the other rules of the Torah. Everything in clear language and terse style, so that the whole oral Torah will become thoroughly known to all without bringing the problems and solutions, differences of opinion, all the disagreements. I'm going to give you just the bottom line, clear, convincing, correct statements that are according to halacha. This is so, that all the rules should be accessible to the small and to the great, and in every commandment, and every mitzvah, and every legislation of the sages and the prophet, in short. This is the, winning, the, the, this is the critical line here so that a person should need no other work in the world with regards to the laws of Torah, but that this work will collect the entirety of the oral Torah, the positive mitzvahs, the customs, the negative laws, everything from the times of Moses up and through the Talmud, including the works of the Gaonim that came afterwards, and all that will be found inside the oral Torah, just the bottom line the Halacha. Thus, I have called the work Mishnah Torah, the complete restatement of Torah, because a person reads the written Torah, and then he reads my book, and you know everything about the oral Torah without needing to read any other book. This sheds light on the goal which he set out to accomplish, to capture all of oral Torah, all the conclusions, in one systematized, organized book an encyclopedia of halacha, of tradition, A to Z, beginning to end. And boy, did he manage to achieve his objective. The Rambam organized halacha with such precision and such perfection. Again, 14 volumes, each volume broken up into sections, each section into subsections, each subsection into numbered paragraphs and subparagraphs, uh, system of organization 
that is so perfect that subsequently people would look at the order of how the Ram, where did the Ram put a particular law? Just where he put it, in what context would teach you what he thought about that particular issue uh, with nuance. The, his contemporaries write about him that the Rambam wrote with the same style as the Mishnah. The Mishnah is a work that preceded him by a thousand years, done over the course of hundreds of years, and done with the entirety of the Sanhedrin on board. And the Rambam... <laughs> and the Rambam, his, his contemporaries write, that the uh, that the you have to read the Rambam the same you read the Mishnah, you have to you have to try to glean from the precise words and all the nuances the same way you would a Mishnah. Now the Rambam really kickstarted this whole idea. Let's take all of halacha and let's try to organize it in. In, in a new fashion. Now, previously, the Rift, we spoke about the Rift. What the Rift did, he did something revolutionary. He did, I'll give you the conclusions of the Talmud, I'll give you the halacha, but he didn't deviate from the format of the Talmud. He still used the 63 books of the Talmud, and he just gave you a digest, a conclusion of the particular Talmudic section. So you would have to still study the whole Talmud to get it. The Rambam creates a whole new format, a whole new system. Not, it's not, it's, it's organized, and it's all, he, he organized by himself, 14 books, starting with the Book of Mada, which was the most controversial, a book of knowledge, which uh, the first section is the foundations of Torah, and then he goes on to the uh, idolatry, laws of idolatry, and then t- Torah study, and then uh, deos, which is character, or beliefs, or knowledges, and lastly, the laws of repentance. Like, these are the core philosophical elements of Jewish life, and then he moves on to the various other books, but it's not following any uh, given format. Uh, then you have the tour. The tour is going to be one of the Rambam's heirs to this idea. He is going to organize it as per the order of the day. He's going to start off with the morning. You wake up in the morning. What do you do in the morning? And go on from there. But it's just fascinating what he did. Um, the Rambam is going to organize, uh, I have over here, the Rambam uh, wrote as a preface to his book, the Sefer HaMitzvos, the Book of Mitzvos, uh, in which he organizes mitzvos. We know the Talmud tells us the 613 mitzvos. Well, that we know, that the Talmud establishes, but what are the 13 mitzvos? The, the, the 613 mitzvos, what are they? What's a mitzvah? What's not a mitzvah? The Ram starts off with an essay giving us 14 different criteria of when a mitzvah is included in the list, when a mitzvah is not included in the list, and a list of all 613 mitzvahs. And that in itself spawns so much commentary and so much analysis and so much works built upon this, uh, both in support and also as well, he spurred uh, those that disagreed with him. And we see the Rambam with everything that he did was so revolutionary and innovative that it was somewhat, uh, great innovators don't always flourish in Judaism or, or, or not, they're not always recognized and accepted. We're very weary of innovators. And uh, the Rambam didn't make his life easier by choosing to not include sources. It's amazing. You have a book that is a condensed version of Talmud that is going to give us all the laws of Talmud, but is not going to attribute where those laws come from. It's just, no one would think of doing something like that. And the Ramam, his intention was to write a book for the layman, not for the scholars. Ironically, it became the exact opposite. It became a book for the scholars and not the layman. But his intention was to not write a, uh, is to not write the sources because the layman don't need the source. They just need the bottom line. But people were very disturbed by that. How do you not include sources? Uh, and they criticized him about that. And they criticized um, other works of the Ram as well. We'll get to the guy to perplexed. They took that and they, uh, they thought there were problems. There were theological problems with the book. And 
unfortunately, tragically, it was burned by some Jewish fanatics. And in fact, there were Jews about 40 years after the Rambam died who informed against the Rambam uh, to the Catholic Church in France. They said that the book contains uh, slights against Christianity and the church burned all copies of the Guide to Perplex and just a few short years later they took in the very same location in, in Paris where they burnt all the Rambam's works they took 24 wagons full of Talmud and they burnt that as well. One of the Rambam's detractors uh, he recognized that, it's not a coincidence, that the very same location that was used to burn the Rambam's works was later on used to burn the Talmud and he uh, was so moved by that he actually traveled to Israel to beg forgiveness from the Rambam by, by his burial site and actually wrote a book the Shari Tshuva, the Gates of Repentance, as a means of personal repentance for siding against the Rambam. And there's a, you know, we see in the Rambam's own letters, you know, how he regretted not including sources, uh, because there was a story, he writes the story here. One, someone came to visit him, and he brought with him a copy of the Mishnah Torah, and he pointed to a particular law in the laws of damages, and in the book of damages, the laws of murder, and he says to me, okay, read, read this law, and I read the law, says the Rambam, and he says, okay, where is this found in the Talmud? So I, respond to, I responded to him, says the Rambam, it's in the book of Makros, or the book of Sanhedrin, where the sections that deal with laws of murder are found. So I says, well, I checked there. It's not there. The Rambam says, okay, pull out the book. I checked it. Couldn't find it either. He says, well, it's in the Jerusalem Talmud. Not in the Jerusalem Talmud. I checked. And I was, you know, the Rambam says, I was, ap- I, I, was, I was beside myself. I was incredulous. Uh, he says, I think maybe to the book of Gittin. And we pulled out the book of Gittin, and I didn't find it. And I was terrified. Where did this come from? And I don't remember. And the guy left. I couldn't find the location. And then I remembered. So I sent someone after him to chase him down. And I brought him back. And I found the source of the matter in the book of Yavamos. Where the book of Yavamos brings it uh, as an aside. The Talmud, it throws in themes tangentially, parenthetically, all over the Talmud. It's even though the section that deals with murder is found primarily in the book of Makros and Sanhedrin. But it was put in as an aside uh, in the book of Yavamos. And... The Rambam writes over here, well, if I don't remember where the place is, how is everyone else going to know where it is? And I regret I should have written an additional book that includes the book, uh, the, the actual uh, sources of every particular law. He didn't end up doing that, unfortunately. Uh, ironically, that did spawn a lot of books as well, because the Rambam's the commentaries in the Rambam, the first thing they do with is the first thing they do is try to attribute where the source of the law is. And sometimes it's very fascinating because the Rambam was a very creative thinker. And sometimes he he would study the Talmud with unfathomable depth. And he reached a conclusion that does not seem to jive with a conclusion that's simply read from our particular Talmud. But he doesn't give you his sources. So you're on your own. And you have to try to deconstruct what he got to and how he got there. How did the Ram reach this? The Gemara says the opposite. What's going on? And obviously the Ram knew this Gemara, and the Ram still wrote this. What? And you're trying to get into the mind of the of a genius to try to figure out what did he see that like what what, what am I missing? And that's why we have today about ten thousand volumes written on this particular book. Uh, astonishing amount of scholarship, uh, whereas the Rambam came to end all books. Again, ironically, he actually began uh, many, many other books. The Rambam's son, Rabbi Avraham, who was his successor, he actually wrote a book that delineated all the sources. Unfortunately, we do not have that book extant, so we don't know where. We don't know what. We don't know. Um, it would have been, you know, who knows what. 
the history of the study of the Rambam would have been had we actually had that. Regardless, this work was accepted by all Jews as the greatest book of the Halachic Code, and the Rambam himself is enshrined uh, as the greatest, or considered, the Rambam himself is considered as the greatest codifier of Jewish law. Of course, he's not going to be the only one, which is going to create problems of its own. We'll have to deal with that sometime in the future uh, in our, in our uh, traversing through Jewish history. Of course, the Rambam also wrote a book called the Morin Nevuchim, the Guide to the Perplexed. He had a student back from his days in Morocco who was prob who was troubled by the problems existing between Torah and science and Torah and predominantly Greek philosophy. In that world that the Rambam lived in, the ideas of Aristotle were almost infallible, and the Rambam wrote an entire book of Jewish philosophy or Jewish Judaism overlaid on this perspective, this outlook of the world. He reconciled Aristotelian, Aristotelian philosophy and Torah, again written in Arabic, and this of course was the most controversial of them all. It's interesting that today it doesn't hold as much prominence as the rest of the realms works because the world has moved away from Greek or ancient Greek philosophy and therefore it's not as pressing to deal with that question. There's new questions that arise, uh, have arisen over the generations and over the centuries and the Rambam in the manner of great Jewish leaders he's always trying to address the needs of the local populace of his constituents and thus that was the need and he responded to it with writing about it. The Rambam wrote many other works, I have a book over here um, called the Igros Rambam, the Letters of the Rambam, it goes through many of the Rambam's letters that he sent on, on general principles. One of them is called the Igaris Taman, the, uh, the letter to the Yemenite Jews. This was written in response to the rabbi of the leader of the Jews in Yemen who was trying to understand, they were grappling with severe, severe persecution on, on the hands of their local uh, Islamic rulers. And also they had another thing thrown into the cauldron, and that is there was a false messiah there as well. So the Rambam, uh, he writes about how to tell who's the real messiah and who's a fake messiah. What's prophecy? What's true prophecy? How do we determine what you know? What's what's real? What's what's wrong? What what's in contrasting Islam with Judaism and Christianity and showing the supremacy, the primacy of Judaism over all of all of those other ones. And in that particular, in that particular uh, letter, he heavily criticizes Islam, going as far as to deem Muhammad, Muhammad the lunatic. At the end of his letter, he writes to the recipient, he says, well, this is what I want from you. I want you to make a copy of this, he calls it a book, and disseminate it to every community in the big cities, in the little towns, in order to strengthen their faith and to buttress, to support their, their life, their, their steps, their footsteps, and they should read it publicly, and the individual should read it, and everyone should proliferate it, everyone should disseminate amongst the people. But you have to be wary that it should not find its way to the hands of the local rulers, because then terrible travesties will befall us. And it is, I'm concludes here, I, re I wrote it, but I'm terrified, very terrified what's going to be. But the reason why I did it is because I realized that the benefit of the masses depends upon it, and I'm willing to take the risk. And he quotes uh, the verse, the teaching that says, Shluche mitzvah einin dizokum. Those that are uh, sent to do a mitzvah, they'll be safe. And there's no way in a mitzvah to save a whole community. And the realm of this particular letter had an enormous impact on the Yemenite community, and uh, from then, uh, thenceforth, the Rambam was considered to be the posseit, the final word of halacha for the Yemenite community because they viewed him as a savior from their existential threat. The Rambam also 
wrote many responses, I wrote many other works. Uh, he himself lived a very chaotic and tragic life, like we mentioned, his, was widowed at a young age. He had children that died in a plague. He lost his brother and financial backer to the storm at sea. Uh, he writes at the end of the introduction to Mishnah, uh, he writes in the end of his commentary on Mishnah, and he says, it's the very last thing he writes in the book of Utsin, all the way at the end of, of the Mishnah, he says, God knows that there's many laws that I wrote over here when I was traveling in caravans, and many of them I wrote when I was in a ship traveling in the Mediterranean. The Rambam, it, does, it seems like he got rid of any white space. He didn't waste time, that's for sure. And that helped him achieve uh, these tremendous accomplishments. Uh, when he died on the 20th day of Teves in, 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 uh, in 1204, the Jews in Egypt observed three days of fast, uh, three days of mourning. There was a fast day declared in Jerusalem. They carried him all the way to Israel. He never got to live in Israel for a significant amount of time, but he was buried there uh, in Tiberias. On his grave, I think it gives a very apt uh, eulogy or, or image, of a departing image for him. On uh, one side it says, Hamuvchar Hamin Ha'enoshi, the choicest of the humankind. And uh, the great Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, one of the great American Rosh Yeshivos, uh, someone once asked him, what kind of strange statement is that? Hamuvchar Hamin Ha'enoshi doesn't appear anywhere else in any Jewish literature. Why would they write this on the Rambam's grave? And he said that the Rambam was very controversial in his life, and even after he died. So some whippersnapper went to the Rambam's, went to Maimonides' his grave, and wrote in it, Hamin. Hamin, the, Hamin in Hebrew means the heretic. So some guy says, I'm going I'm to, he went and he defiled the grave, wrote the her Hamin. So someone else came and, and added, one word before that, one word after. Hamuvchar Hamin Ha'enosha. The word Min can mean either heretic or kind. So he just, he amended it and said, Hamuvchar Hamin the choicest of the human kind. That's on one side of the grave. On the other side of the grave, it says the famous words, Mimosha Ad Moshe Lokam Kemosha. From Moshe, from Moses. Until Moshe, until Moshe Maimonides, there was no one like the Rambam, no one like Moshe. Uh, indeed, his influence on the Jewish people uh, certainly according to the people who were contemporaneous to him, approached the influence of Moshe. He was uh, the greatest of the Rishonim, certainly on the Sephardic side, the man of the millennium, him and, the Ra him and Rashi Mebiara, uh, co-holders of that title. And he did more than anyone else. Uh, he began the effort of codifying halacha after the Talmudic era. I'll take a few quick, quick questions, very quick, because I have to run, but go ahead. I have two quick ones. Number go one, ahead. did he, did the uh, Maimonides get buried in Egypt and then no, moved? No, no. That's they, false. That's false. Uh, yes, right. they, there is a legend that he, they put him on a camel, and the camel walked itself. We know he's buried in Tiberias. And the other one's not about Maimonides, but you talked about Murano's before? Yes. Is it? There's, a, there's some feeling that Christopher Columbus might have been a moron. What do you, do you, have you heard that before? I have heard it, um, maybe. Well, and even if he himself wasn't a moron, it's possible that people who were with him on the ship and the expedition were, were. Yeah. Okay, so he's a teenager, he's in a cave, so he's writing this stuff yes. on what? He has a Torah, he has... Well, I mean, we're... The, the Rambam, he, we cannot use any any metric that you could use to measure human ability. Yeah. Don't use it for the Rambam. you got to scrap that all. Yeah. It doesn't matter the cave or not. Yeah. Yeah, the Rambam knew everything by heart. Not, he just knew the Talmud, and, and he knew it all, and he could just there, put it out there. The standards of what we... Well, we don't have a full copy of it. We have part, part of it. But the standards of what's possible all have to be scrapped when we talk about the Rambo. Just scrap it. Yeah. I have a question. Quickly, quickly. So, so is the Shulchan Aruch does also... Is we'll get to the Shulchan Aruch in a little bit. What he did, he, he had to deal with a lot of moving parts so, to get to where so, he got So, you to. know, 
what what is what is what is what people follow? Right now, the Jewish people have accepted the Shulchan Aruch as the final word of halacha. Okay, so we'll talk about that another yes. time. Yes, okay. we'll have to talk about that another okay, time. Okay, because I'd like to know why that is. All right. Okay, I apologize for going.